And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Sophia Dannenberg. Like so many of our students, like so many of our students, Sophia's relationship with the outdoors started with access, a singular experience in the natural world. The knowledge that it was a space where she belonged, despite the fact that she did not see others who looked like her on trail. And then those repeated outdoor experiences that eventually led her to peak, to the peak and summit of Mount Everest in 2006. Today, Sophia is an international leader in environmental sustainability and serves, did I mention this before, on the Nature Bridge Board of Directors. Please join me in welcoming Sophia Dannenberg. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be on the board of this amazing organization and to have the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Early in life, I would have seemed like an unlikely candidate to be up here. I was born in Japan and mostly raised in the very flat Midwest as part of a family that most recently, Midwesterners, woo, <laughs> part of a family that most, uh, that, that could best be described as indoorsy. When I was young, going outside meant riding my bike around the neighborhood, or taking golf and tennis lessons, or going to the local pool. I did the typical sports, basketball, volleyball, track, cross country. Sadly, I had to give up soccer because I was not the most coordinated kid and sprained my ankle three times before the age of eight. My fondest vacation memories are of Disney World and of road trips to Wisconsin Dells, to visit Xanadu, the house of the future, and to, go and to ride go-karts, which I crashed because I've also not been good with speed either. But there were hints, even then, that I might be a little different. Starting from the days playing in the sugarcane fields with my cousins in Okinawa. Then when we moved to Cincinnati, the after-school gatherings of the neighborhood kids in the forests behind our townhouses where we would climb trees and explore. My obsession with fireflies. And that one year that I begged for a rock tumbler for Christmas. Still, I never hiked or backpacked or camped until the week before I started college when I signed up to do all three on the same trip through the presidential range in New Hampshire as part of the freshman outdoor program. I remember getting the gear list and it was like backpack, pants, two, shirt, three, socks, four. And then in big bold letters after each clothing item, it said, no cotton, wool or synthetic only. You've probably seen like these lists like this. So I seriously just went out and bought normal like everyday wool clothes button-down shirts and men's wool pants and coats. All secondhand, of course, because, you know, why waste your money on clothes that you're only going to use once? Because I was convinced I would never do anything like that again. I found a used external frame backpack somewhere, and I was off. I must have looked like a cross between, like, a 90s grunge walker and John Muir, having not learned about the advances in outdoor material technology that had happened through the entire 20th century. Um, sorry, REI. That is how little I knew, and I was 18 years old. It was another 10 years before I wandered into a Patagonia store in Tokyo and inquired about rock climbing lessons from a tall, lanky Japanese man called Jack. And I still remember his name. I remember everything about him. And a couple of years after that, I decided to climb Kilimanjaro because I had heard about the snows of Kilimanjaro from the Hemingway story, and I had studied environmental science in college, so I knew the snow cap was disappearing and I wanted to see it before it went away. Then when I was living in Connecticut, my best friend from high school suggested that we climb Mount Rainier. And I said, sure, even though I actually didn't know where or exactly what Mount Rainier was. 
all these small series of yeses put me on a path. And that path led me, led me to the incredible night of May 16, 2006. At about 3 a.m., we reached the balcony, a natural resting spot at 8,400 meters on Mount Everest. Panuru and I had started our summit push early, and, or sorry, started our summit, summit push at about 11 p.m., a couple of hours later than usual, waiting out the blizzard. But we made good time passing other teams. We were taking turns breaking trail and knew from the, knew from the fixed rope buried in the snow and the lack of footprints that we were the first to the balcony that night. Panudu's brother, Mingma, was working as a porter carrying oxygen for another team, and he arrived shortly after us. Now, as the three of us peered down the steep slope, we couldn't see anyone. There were no headlamps. We didn't know if they had all turned around and if we were alone on the mountain. Base camp was reporting unstable conditions over the radio, and it was unusually windy, even for that altitude and we were concerned a squall might form. So we had to make a decision, turn around or continue. Below, we could see a floor of clouds and occasional little flashes, which was the lightning from the storm that we had just climbed through. But above was the clearest sky I have ever seen or will probably ever see in my entire life. So we went up. A few hours later, at 7 a.m., the three of us stood on top of Mount Everest with light flurries and wind and the surrounding mountains just peeking up from the clouds. It felt like another world. I knew from all the stories how special it was to be up there in that peace and quiet with so few people. It was spectacular. I'm often asked about that moment, if it was everything I had hoped for, if I had dreamed about it my whole life. And the answer is, well, no, not exactly. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a drummer or a track star or a princess. And I am still sure that I could rock a tiara if there are any princes out there. <laughs> As I got older, I thought maybe a lawyer or a diplomat. I never would have dreamed of climbing Mount Everest because I had never heard of Mount Everest. And as far as I know, neither had anyone else in my family. At the time that Hillary and Norgay were making the first summits in the 50s, my father lived in poverty in rural South Carolina where Jim Crow laws were still enforced and the white families founded a private academy rather than send their children to school with the black kids after Brown versus Board of Education. He didn't have electricity, so he would go to the principal's house to study after dark. It probably didn't hurt that the principal had two daughters around his age. My mother's family in Okinawa didn't have electricity either, or an indoor bathroom for that matter, or plumbing. They were laborers on other people's farms. Even if I had learned about Everest growing up, I might have had a hard time imagining myself as a mountaineer. When I was about 16, some guy that I had just met and who I never saw again said after a brief conversation that I was going to be the first black president, which was awfully forward thinking for the time. Obviously, he was wrong, <laughs> but even that would have seemed more realistic than climbing Everest. I probably would have pictured a mountaineer to be some grizzly, tall, white dude with a lot of muscles and like a square jaw and like a mustache who looked like he needed a shower and wore knee-length trousers. Wool, of course, not cotton. And let's be honest, so would most people. That's still generally how people think of mountaineers today. Minus the wool trousers, of course, they've updated the technology. And it makes sense. Of the roughly 5,300 people who have summited Mount Everest, 500 or 550 of them are women. Four are black, and I am the only black woman. There are... <laughs> Thank you. There are 
there are more double amputees who have climbed to the summit of Mount Everest than black, black women. Not that Everest is the best example, it's just the type of mountain that people keep those types of statistics on, but anecdotal evidence would suggest that the pattern isn't that different on other mountains. I've actually never seen in real life another black person at high altitude, not even climbing. It's only recently and only rarely that I run into other black people hiking or that I had to describe myself as anything other than the black girl when explaining to new climbing partners how to find me at an indoor climbing gym. And indoor rock climbing isn't exactly the bastion of exclusivity and elitism. It's going to be an Olympic sport after all. To some, this doesn't seem like a big deal, but we can't underestimate the impact that representation has on children, how much it matters to them to see people like themselves. I had a colleague whose wife is a doctor, and someone was having one of those, like, what are you gonna be when you grow up, conversations with his young son, who was about three or four at the time, and said, maybe you'll be a doctor. And his son replied, a little bit surprised, but only girls are doctors. His pediatrician was a woman as well, so it was all I knew at the time. Although, don't worry, I'm sure he learned soon enough that boys can be doctors too. At the Nature Bridge Olympic campus, I don't know if they have to actually do this at other places, um, they do an exercise towards the, the end of the program, asking students what a scientist looks like. And the educator like draws as the, as the students call out the answers. And you know, it's like, he's wearing a lab coat, he's got kind of crazy hair, a little bit long, a mustache. Most groups basically end up drawing Albert Einstein. And sadly, these stereotypes don't just disappear as we get older. In college, I had an assignment to debate development in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuges from the perspective of a randomly assigned group. The local native population, the Inupiaq, the environmental activists, the energy company, the politicians, etc. cetera. Um, I was assigned the Inupiaq. And I mentioned this over dinner with a friend's family and his mother replied, well, it's a good thing you weren't assigned the environmental activist because you're entirely too pretty and fashionable to be an environmentalist. <laughs> this despite the fact that I was an environmental science major and I bought almost all of my clothes at thrift shops. It goes beyond stereotypes though. It's this message that people, especially adults, sometimes inadvertently send that everything has to be done in a certain way by a particular type of person. People who are introduced to me as the woman who climbed Everest often are surprised to meet me. Usually it's something about my appearance that I'm smaller than they expected, that's a big one. But also I've had people say that it has something to do with how I'm dressed at an event like this one, as if I should be walking around all the time with an ice axe hanging over my shoulder. I mean, I, I would look tough. I definitely would look tough, but I would never get through TSA. <laughs> Narrow perspectives about what types of people do certain things are especially problematic when we're talking about environmentalism. Looking back on that exercise in college, I believe there was a fundamental flaw in the basic premise that an environmental activist and those other roles were mutually exclusive. That you had to choose between being an environmentalist or working for an energy company, or being a politician, or being a member of a historically low-income and marginalized community like the Inupiaq. And I get it. My friends in environmental circles are often surprised and a little disappointed that I work at a corporation. But what would our companies or our country look like if there were no environmentalists at corporations? We need environmentalists to become architects so we can build structures that work with our natural environment, engineers to design products that use less energy, software to make our devices more efficient, artists to create works that inspire, divers to protect the marine environment, chefs to find ways to minimize food waste, and of course, politicians and corporate executives and members of the community to support these efforts and more through decisions they make every day. Okay. 
have we benefit as a society when environmentalists are everywhere? I often say that I don't speak to young people about my Everest story because I necessarily want them to become climbers. Maybe some will, but mainly I want to expose them to something new, to widen their perspective a little bit. And in the same way, NatureBridge isn't just about developing future environmental scientists or outdoor educators. NatureBridge instills values around environmental stewardship. By supporting NatureBridge tonight, you're allowing the largest, broadest, most diverse population possible to be exposed to these learning opportunities. You are sowing seeds that with care and nurturing will grow and spread to different communities and professions and have impact beyond what we can imagine today. Like a small black girl from an indoorsy Midwestern suburbanite family ending up on the summit of Everest, you don't know where those seeds might land. I'm so grateful to you for allowing you to tell me, allowing you to tell me, allow, I'm so grateful to you for allowing me to tell my story tonight, but especially for supporting NatureBridge students on their journeys to becoming environmental activists. Thank you. <laughs>